This is our final message in the Sabbath series. Have you enjoyed the Sabbath series? Yeah, amen. Good, 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 good. A little bit different than what we've done so far, more topical, um, but I'm hoping that it was educational for you, that you you have a deeper understanding of the Sabbath. Um, You have your Bibles. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 1, verses 13 through 14. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. The Word of God says, and you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal. You were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for again trusting us in this space, this sacred space for us to continue this series and and, uh, experience its conclusion. We ask for your spirit to again fall afresh on us, seal us with your Holy Spirit so that we understand your word and we're inspired by it. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Let everyone say amen and amen. We have, we have, from the very beginning, talked about the original intent of the Sabbath when it was first incorporated in, our, in, in humanity's existence. It was given as a day of rest, not a rest from being tired, but a rest from completion. God rested not because he was tired. He rested because he was pleased with the finished product. Who was the finished product? We are the finished product. We are the finished product. You are the finished product. The Sabbath says in its conception simply this, God likes you. God likes you. And it's a day that is very similar to our birthday. It is the very first holiday, the very first holy day. Remember that word holy simply means to set apart. It is a special day, and God did so because he likes you. But after sin, we learned the Sabbath had another layer to it. It was necessary because we were tired. The Bible tells us in Genesis chapter 3 that because of sin, that Adam and Eve would toil all the days of their life. The Sabbath then became necessary. It was almost like labor laws. You could not be overworked. God protected our mental and physical health. The Sabbath became so important that you had to keep it and observe it, not only for yourself, but for others in your household on penalty of death. You had to rest because we were tired. Later on, God then expresses why the Sabbath is important. He expresses that the Sabbath is important because you were once slaves. You knew what it was like to be Uh, 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 taken against your will and forced to do labor, to not have a will of your own. So the Sabbath then became a declaration that God is our deliverer, and we are also called to help deliver people. Even when in Exodus 16, when, when God first instructed them not to go out and collect the manna on the seventh day, it was also representing God as our provider. I will provide enough for you in those six days that you will not need to go out on the seventh day. When we come into the seventh day Sabbath, it is us acknowledging to our creator that you are our provider. I don't need to do any more. You have done enough. Amen? Nehemiah chapter 8 tells us that 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 is a day of holy convocation and worship. Leviticus 23 tells us it's a holy day of convocation. Nehemiah 8 tells us how they convocated, that they worshiped. They worshiped from daybreak all the way until noon. They lifted up holy hands. They, They praised the Lord. They shouted amen. They fell prostrate on the ground. They wept. And then the spiritual leader said, do not cry, for this is a day of joy. The joy of the Lord is your strength. Go home and eat the best food. Feast and drink the best beverages. It was a day of rejoicing. Isaiah tells us it's a day of delight. Do not Do not force anybody uh, to work. 
Do not make it burdensome. In Isaiah 60, in Isaiah 58, it tells us that, that it is, we are not to take advantage of one another. We're not even to burden each other with unnecessary religious formalities. It needs to be a day of delight when we come together. And we were challenged to do that, that worship experience, the convocation together, it should be a day of joy because the joy of the Lord is our strength. We thank you also, Pastor Ivars, for taking us through in our study and realizing that, that Jesus and the Sabbath, that Jesus is the, the absolute perfect expression of the Sabbath. Come unto me, all who are heavy laden and burdened, and I will give you rest. Jesus himself is the rest. Jesus himself, he is the perfect representation of the Sabbath, is a shadow of things to come. But we learned even in looking at the shadows that the seventh-day Sabbath wasn't simply a foreshadow of the cross. It really wasn't. It was a shadow of creation and what God did. But what the Sabbath did point us to is the rest we would experience after the cross. Just as Jesus rested after the cross, we also have been called in Hebrews chapter 4 to enter into his rest because of his redemptive work. We now on Sabbath day can celebrate the rest we have in Jesus. Amen? You see, you, you, you can't even celebrate the resurrection unless you celebrate the rest. Before Jesus was resurrected, he didn't just die and immediately pop up out of the grave. He rested to signify the importance of us entering in that rest. We no longer have to work for our salvation. He has done enough. Amen? Jesus has done enough. And last week we were challenged to abide in Christ, abide in him. The Sabbath becomes a day of abiding that we remain in him and he remains in us, that focused intimacy, that special time that we can have that we are not afforded often during the week because of work and other responsibilities. But this seventh day Sabbath, we can come together and be reminded that God at the end of the day simply wants to abide in us and for us to abide in him. It has always been about relationship, amen? And the seventh day Sabbath is about relationship. We learned that if it's law and not love, we've missed the point. If it's simply law that keeps us, keep, you know, keeps us uh, observing the Sabbath and not love, we've missed the boat. The law is necessary because of sin and stubbornness and hard-headedness. But we who entered a relationship with Jesus, who are in love with Jesus, we don't need the law to enforce the Sabbath. We're already engaged. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Not love me and prove it by keeping my commandments. He says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Love is the basis. It is the fuel. It is the foundation. It is even what the law is based on. Love, love, love. So we get to this final message, and I have to go here because in our eschatology, the study of the second coming and the climactic endpoints of Earth's history, we have to talk about the Sabbath because we were all raised in a denomination that told us that we would one day have a test of faith, that one day our, our allegiance to God would be challenged by how we keep the Sabbath, that one day our governments would, would, would unite with other religious powers and they would enforce the National Sunday Law where we would have to adhere to the religious authorities and governmental uh, 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 powers and we would be forced to worship on Sunday. We would, we would be imprisoned if we kept the Sabbath holy instead of keeping Sunday holy. It is that Sunday was known as the mark of the beast and the Sabbath would be known as the seal of God's protection and his approval. How many were raised knowing that and teaching, being taught that? How many? How many? Right? Most of us. Most of us. Most of us. And for those of you who are new to Adventism, this is all going to be new for you. Now, this isn't terribly unique to Adventism. We're not the first denomination to keep the Seventh-day Sabbath holy. We got it from the, the Seventh-day Baptist. Okay? In fact, there are 500 denominations, over 500 denominations, that keep the Seventh-day Sabbath holy. You thought you were special. <laughs> and many of them also believe, also believe that keeping the Sabbath is necessary. That's why they do it. It's important. Now, just for a little bit of recognition here, 
most of the world now is on to the Sabbath truth. Now, not maybe the actual date, but the principles behind the Sabbath. There have been so many books written recently on the Sabbath, coming from people that, 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 that keep Sunday holy and see Sunday as the Sabbath. Many people now embrace the healthy, emotional, physical uh, uh, um, uh, benefits of the Sabbath. And so it is now a big deal within Christianity. In fact, they like using the term Sabbath. But we've learned that the seventh day Sabbath is the day that God set aside, not Sunday. He set aside the Sabbath, the seventh day, which we call Saturday. And so in all of this understanding, we have, we have been taught that one day, one day, one day, our allegiance to God will come down to which day we worship on. When I was younger, I was afraid of this moment. I was told that maybe we would be at gunpoint and someone would ask us, do we keep the seventh day Sabbath? And we would have to say yay or nay. And our life would be on the line. Anybody remember hearing some of that? We'd be thrown into prison. We would, we would be fired from our jobs. Uh, our children would be taken from us. All of these things, right? And before you know it, those who were Sunday worshipers were seen in many ways as our enemies. The Catholic Church was, was enemy number one in our evangelistic crusades. We would talk about the mark of the beast and how the Catholic Church changed the days and the times and, and, and we must avoid them at all costs. I remember one young girl in one of the Bible classes I taught walked out in tears because she says, I'm going to be lost. I said, well, why? She says, because I go to church on Sunday and I'm going to burn one day because of it. In fact, even when we talk about our evangelistic series, even when we talk about our evangelistic series, often we'll say this. We had thousands of people accept the Sabbath truth. Not Jesus, but the Sabbath truth. Why is that? Because in our traditional evangelism, we weren't trying to win people to Jesus. They were already on Jesus' side. They just were missing this one truth, this one necessary ingredient to their faith that they needed to add so they can be complete commandment-keeping people. And so the Sabbath became the, 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 the rallying cry to true allegiance and obedience to God. So, Pastor, what do we do with all this? Everything you've been teaching us is cool, it's great. I now have a greater appreciation for the Sabbath. But at the end of time, what does it all mean? Well, first, I want to clear up a couple of things here. It's in our text. The seal of God has always been, biblically speaking, not a commandment, but the Holy Spirit. I need to say this again. The seal of God that's spoken of in Revelation, that God would seal his people at the end of time, has always been the Holy Spirit. Look at Ephesians chapter 4. This is not our text. This is later on in the book of Ephesians. It tells us in verse 30 of chapter 4, it says, And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. So just in case you're wondering when that sealing comes, Right? It is there on the day of redemption, the day of Jesus' second coming. Then when we would be, we would experience the full fruits of redemption. Not just forgiveness of sin while we're living on this side of eternity, but also the gift of eternity. The seal of God has always been the Holy Spirit. In fact, it is the one sign that clearly communicated that God was with his people. You remember in Acts chapter 15 when circumcision used to be the sign of people's connection and allegiance to God? Remember when the Jews were, were, were making it mandatory for the Gentiles to be circumcised so that they could clearly be a part of that covenant between God and man? And what did the brethren do? In Acts chapter 15, the Bible tells us that they, that they came together, they convened and they prayed and they were led to tell the people Physical circumcision is no longer a requirement. Question, how did they come to that? How did they come to it that physical circumcision would no longer be a requirement? Did Jesus tell them to do that? 
Did it say somewhere in the Old Testament that the day is coming when circumcision would no longer be required? In Acts chapter 15, they came together and led by the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit as their guide, they went before the people and said, this is a yoke that nobody really could bear. No more circumcision. In fact, they, they threw out some other stuff, but, you know, James did say, well, but we can't eat stuff that's offered to idols. That one has to stay. And then Paul later on goes, well, I guess if you bless it, it's okay. It almost seems like they're flying by the seat of their pants, de determining what real doctrine is. But watch this, watch this, watch this. They, they could do this because they were led by the Holy Spirit. In other words, the inspiration that was being given to them was building on the inspiration that they had in the Old Testament. See, before the New Testament, there was only the Old Testament. Every time Peter or Paul talked about scriptures, they were never talking about their own emails. You know that, right? They were never talking about their own text messages. They never thought they would one day be canonized with Exodus and Numbers and Joshua, Judges, Ruth. They never thought so. But the Holy Spirit was moving upon them, and they were giving, at that time, present truth. Does the word present truth mean anything to you? Present truth mean anything to you? Present truth is the belief that God in every generation is sharing more and more light upon his people that they are to take and grow, as, 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 as uh, Ellen White says, improve on the light. Improve on the light in our day as our forefathers improved on the light in their day. And that's exactly what the early church, the first century church was doing. They were improving, they were improving. And Jesus did a bit of that. Remember his Sermon on the Mount? You have heard that it has been said, do not commit adultery, but I tell you this, do not what? Do not what? Do not lust. Did Jesus up the ante or did he back down? What he upped the ante. Now watch this, watch this. He upped the ante, but, him, but, but Jesus saying do not even lust did not cancel out adultery. You know that, right? It's not like he said, hey, adultery is cool now, guys. Just don't lust and you'll be good. See, adultery still stood, but Jesus took it further. He took it further. See, new revelation never cancels out old revelation. Oh, you thought I was going to go somewhere else with that, huh? New revelation never cancels out old revelation. It is a further development of it. It's, it's improving on it. It's, it's, like, it's like if you had a flashlight in this church and when it's, all the lights are off and it's nighttime. I've done this before. I use the flashlight on my phone and I've had to walk around and I have the flashlight. I now know not to bump into the pews. But if I turned on all the lights, if I turned on all the lights, do they cancel out the light of my flashlight? No, they never cancel it out. But when all the lights are on, I, I, I don't notice the brightness of my flashlight anymore. It doesn't mean it's canceled out. I just see now more to it. And this is what happens with new revelation. It doesn't cancel out the old, but it gives further meaning and understanding. So we go, oh, that's what you meant by the Sabbath. Thank you, Jesus. You helped me. So what do we do when we look at our church's history, our denomination's history, and we have read stuff that talks about uh, 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 the Sabbath being the seal of God if we keep it, and, and, and that the mark of the beast would be Sunday worship? What do we do with this? This is why so many of us are concerned what the president is doing and if they're going golf with the Pope or something like that. Remember all those emails we would get all the time? We're consumed with it. In fact, I grew up in an era where we were waiting for the National Sunday Law to pass before we got our lives together. I know some out there are feeling the same way. You had, a, you had a warning sign. Wait till the Sunday Law passes and then we'll be good. Well, let me tell you something. This is going to hurt your feelings, but let me say this. The Sunday Laws have already been passed. The Sunday Laws have already been passed. They're in most of our counties and governments on paper. They're called the blue laws, the Sunday laws, where people were restricted from working. They had to close down their shops. They couldn't buy alcohol. They couldn't buy certain uh, uh, items. They were in some, in some countries, in some towns, 
you were encouraged strongly to go to worship? There's a reason why football games start after 1 o'clock. Hello? I know Pacific time, we get the East Coast, so it's 10 a.m., but on the East Coast, they start at 1 o'clock because they want people to be in church on Sunday. A lot of your malls are opening up at noon or 1 o'clock, right? Still following a lot of those, of those uh, blue laws. Even during Ellen White's time, there, were, there was national Sunday laws. Now, I know, I know, the way in which we had understood it, it was going to be a national Sunday law where, again, we would be threatened to death. I get it, I get it, I get it. But I want to read some stuff to you. I'm going to read some stuff to you, and I'm going to read it from uh, Sister White, if you don't mind. There's a couple of quotes from her. There's so many, but because of time, we only can go into a little bit of it. Let, 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 let me look at this. Let's, let's look at this real quick here. Um, go, uh, the, the very first one, the very first quote here, it says, we as a people... We as a people, that's kind of small, I know it is, but you can trust me. We as a people have not accomplished the work which God has committed to us. We are not ready for the issue to which the enforcement of the Sunday law will bring us. It is our duty as we see the signs of approaching peril to arouse to action. Let none sit in calm expectation of the evil, comforting themselves with what? The belief that this work must go on because prophecy has foretold it and that the Lord will shelter his people. We are not doing the will of God if we sit in quietude doing what? Nothing to preserve liberty of conscience. Fervent, effectual prayer should be ascending to heaven that this calamity may be deferred until we can accomplish the work which has so long been neglected. Let there be more earnest prayer, and then let us work in harmony with our prayers. I'm not sure if you caught this, but Auntie Ellen says here that we should never sit back and say, oh, well, it's going to happen. It's been prophesied. Let's do nothing about it. She says, no, 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 no. We should never sit back in quietude and do nothing. We should be working against something like that going down. We should do whatever we can to, to, to support our liberty because at the core of the Sabbath issue has always been liberty. Liberty and justice for all. Freedom. You're free. You were once slaves, but you're now free. And this is what the Sabbath is proclaiming, and it almost sounds a little bit patriotic. We should never sit back and say, oh, it's prophecy, and we do this so well. When we hear about calamities happening in the world, what do we do? Ooh, did you hear what happened? An earthquake? Do you know how many people it killed? Oh, my word. The Lord is coming soon. It's almost, it's almost like entertaining on some level. We, because we're, we just want to know that prophecy is being fulfilled. But none of us have this response. Let's pray. We're canceling our Europe uh, vacation. We're going to go and help. We're going to assist the Red Cross, the Blue Cross. We're going to assist ADRA. We're going to go over there. We're going to do whatever we can to show that God still loves them and cares instead of sitting back and going, mm-hmm, that's judgment. That's ju the Lord ain't pleased. We should be doing everything we can. Watch this for prophecy not to be fulfilled as it has been foretold. And you know, I know who did that back in the day? It's in the book of Jonah, a little small book, four chapters. There was a prophecy, in 40 days, Nineveh will be overthrown. They heard the prophecy, they believed the prophecy so much that they began to fast and pray, fast and pray, and worked in harmony with their prayer. So much so that the Bible tells us, uh, Jonah chapter 3, verse 10, that God changed his mind. Not his heart, not his character, because his heart and character change not. But his mind changed because Nineveh had changed. What would you do if the Pope one day decides to convert? Oh, you wouldn't know what to do with yourself. <laughs> All your conspiracy theories, you wouldn't know what to do with yourself. We are so afraid as a people that we, ecumenic, 
ecumenism, we'll stay away from it. No, nope, we cannot, we cannot, we cannot go hand in hand with them. We don't know what they really believe or what they teach, and one day they're going to imprison us. Leave them alone. And we as Adventists have been an island to ourselves. You're only in if you're a part of our denomination. But let me tell you something, Sister White does not teach that. She does not teach that. Working in a very contemporary world at the time, she encouraged us to work hand in hand with people of, other differ of, of differing faiths and belief systems if we're all working for the betterment of people. Watch this now, watch this. You'll say, but pastor, there should be no compromise. We, we can't do this. We can't be seen mingling with them. We can't. Do you know when she was living in Australia because the church ostracized her in Australia because she was too radical? So they sent her to Australia to hopefully quiet her up. You didn't even know about that. It's when she pinned some of her best work. She said that, 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 that the, the school, Avondale, they did so much work in the, in the community that even when the law enforcement would go by and see them working on Sunday, they would leave those Adventist students alone. Because they said, They're, these are good people. We'll leave them alone. Now, they could have imprisoned them. They could have, they could have cited them. They, 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 they could have fined them. But they chose to leave them alone. Sister White even said, you, you, should, you should not hang up, hang up your laundry on Sunday and not offend your neighbor who keeps Sunday as Sabbath. Not hang up your laundry? Not mow your lawn because somebody keeps Sunday as the seventh-day Sabbath. But that's what she said. Don't be intentionally offensive. But Sister White, we should boldly proclaim our faith. Yet she was strategic. You want to hear something else she was strategic about? You're going to lose your mind. Last quote here. Last quote here. She says, Sunday. She says, Sunday can be used for carrying forward various lines of work that will accomplish much for the Lord. This is what she says in light of them passing the National Sunday Law and forcing us to do spiritual things. She says, well, you know, we can take advantage of this. On this day, open air meetings and cottage meetings can be held. House to house work can be done. Those who write can devote this day to writing their articles. Whenever it is possible, let religious services be held on Sunday. I need to stop right now. What? What did you just say? What? What did you just say? Whenever possible, let religious services be held on Sunday. Make these meetings intensely interesting. Sing genuine revival hymns. Now, just so you know, revival hymns had a little bit more umph to them. I got some quotes on that stuff. Y'all don't even know. You don't, she, she advocated for praise teams. Believe it or not, she says it shouldn't just be one person. You should get the best singers in your congregation, and they should do their best to sing in harmony and make sure that people know the words are familiar with the songs. And she said, and you should add instruments when available and when are able to because it will add to the interest of the meeting. Rebel. <laughs> Sing genuine revival hymns and speak with power and assurance of the Savior's love. Speak on temperance and on true religious experience. You will thus learn much about how to work and will reach many souls. What's the motivation? Reach many souls. What is our inspiration? Reaching many souls. We need to do a better job. We've turned this almost into a circus. We'll go up to people and say, you're worshiping on the wrong day. That's not the argument you need to have with people. You're worshiping on the wrong day. Let them worship every single day. What you need to offer them is the gift that God had given them from the beginning of creation, a day of rest, a day for abiding, a day of delight, a day where we can just turn off technology for a minute, a day where husbands and wives get to look each other in the eyes and speak to one another and, 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 and hear their, ch their children's voice maybe for the first time that week, a day of rejoicing. That's what we should be offering. Not that they're going to church on the wrong day. Let me tell you, every day is the right day to go to church. And if we have a worship service on Tuesday, I hope people don't call us Tuesday worshipers. We're not worshiping Tuesday. We're worshiping, on, we're worshiping Jesus. It just happens to be on Tuesday. 
Now, I get it. Now, let's listen. She's strategic here. She's strategic. She's saying open air meeting. She's not saying in the church because she knows that if it happens in the church, it will seem like we're too aligned. So she's being strategic. She's like, keep, 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 keep the church closed, but, but have some tent meetings and be in the homes and still do spiritual things. Because she doesn't want people to think that we have aligned ourselves so much so that we no longer value the Seventh-day Sabbath. So don't worry, I'm not advocating that we ever open up our church on Sunday unless it's a revival or evangelistic series with Daniel and Revelation. (laughs) Then we'll do that. But for sure not on Sunday morning. Absolutely not. My point is simply this, family. We're having the wrong conversations. We're having the wrong conversations about prophecy. We're having the wrong conversations about the seal of God. We're having the wrong conversations about eschatology. We are, we're having it. And I know what you're going to say. You're going to say, but pastor, we are the commandment keeping people. This is what Revelation describes as those who have the spirit of prophecy and they keep the commandments of God. Yes, they do. But can I show you what those people look like? Can I show you? Matthew 25. Jesus is telling his disciples of what the end time will be like, and then he describes what the people of God who are sealed by his Holy Spirit look like. You want to know what they look like? When I was hungry. When I was hungry, you gave me something to eat. When I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. When I was naked, you clothed me. When I was in prison because I was guilty, you visited me. And you know what they say? These are people who don't even keep the commandments of God. They don't even know what the left hand, the right hand is doing. They're like, when did we do these things? When did we do these things? They're not doing it because the law demands for them to do it. They're doing it because of what? Love. The Holy Spirit is abiding in them. God has wrote his new covenant in their hearts and their minds. And now, they say, Lord, when did we? Remember Matthew 7, the the law-abiding ones? Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and perform many miracles in your name? Did we not? Did we not? Did we not? When you become transformed into the character of God, I said this last week, I know it hits you the wrong way. I'm telling you, Jesus didn't keep the law of God. He was the law of God. It's his character. Jesus never had to say, okay, Dad, um, let me study the law so I know what to do today. All Jesus had to be was himself. And we're going to get there one day. As God continues to work on us, Sister White says that when God's character is perfectly reproduced in his people, then he will come. What's the last sign of the time, family? What's the last sign of the time? The last sign of the time isn't an earthquake. Go to Matthew. I, I know I don't have this on the, on, the, on, the, on the screen, but go to Matthew. Matthew chapter 24. Matthew 24. Verse 14. What's the last sign of the time? It's not rumors of wars, more wars. It's not earthquakes. The last sign of the time is exactly what Sister White says it is. Matthew 14, 24, verse 14 says, oh, I'll read a little bit more. I'll read a little bit more. Come on, come on, come on. We got, we got time. He says in verse 9, then you will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death, and you will be hated by all nations because of me. Christ is talking about what would happen in their generation with the destruction of Jerusalem and the persecution of the early church. He's also, he's also prophesied in the future what would happen in the last generation. At that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other, and many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will what? What is the effect of people no longer connected to God or not sealed by God's Spirit, not moved by God's Spirit? How does it manifest itself? Their love does what? It grows cold. That is how you know people are off. They don't know how to love. Their love grows cold. It says, but the one who stands firm to the end will be what? Saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to how many nations? All nations. And then the end will come. 
the gospel of this kingdom will be preached as a testimony, meaning lived out, and then the end shall come. So I want to say something to you, and I'm, I'm done, I'm done, I'm done, I'm done, I'm done. Watch this, watch this, watch this. I can't wait until our evangelistic series have nothing to do with Daniel and Revelation, but simply showing up in a city and feeding people. I can't wait until we do not meet as a general conference once every five years, spending 60, 70, 80 million dollars on tickets, on hotels, on venues, on chairs. You know how much money we spend on chairs? Just chairs to seat people and decide to actually build schools that can be affordable for our community to attend. You see, see, see. When the seal of God is covering us, we're inspired to do things that go far beyond whatever we read in the law. The law is just a foundation. It's just, it's two plus two. But God says, my spirit will take you to a greater height. See, see, the law folk will say, Lord, what must I do to be saved? Tell me what I must do. Give me the law. And Jesus is like, all right, you want to play that game? Let's play it. And then Christ says, all right, I'm going to ask you to do something I know you cannot do. It'll be law, but you will not be able to do it. He could not give up his money. But the next chapter in Luke, the very next chapter, another rich man by the name of Zacchaeus, Christ never asked him for a penny, never asked him for sacrifice, but just eating with Zacchaeus, just fellowshipping with Zacchaeus, just Jesus knocking at his door and Zac opening up and supping with him changed his life. And he says, Lord, here and now, I sell half of my possessions, give the money to the poor, and if I've cheated anyone out of anything, I'll pay back four times the amount. How much money do you think Zach ended up with? Christ never asked for a penny. He didn't have to. When we get to that place, family, the left hand won't know what the right hand is doing. When did we, Lord? Lord, you know we're not trying to earn our way in. We're not trying to keep a, a tab. Lord, we're just, we're just in love with you. The Sabbath in prophecy the Sabbath in prophecy is everything that we have studied, that we get to the point where we say, Lord, you're my provider, even in the end times. Lord, you're the one that sustains me, even in the end times. You're the one that has worked for me so that I can rest. Adam and Eve never worked, and they still entered his rest. This is what's so powerful about, about Hebrews 4. We get to enter into his rest. I don't care if it's the Pope, if it's a non-religious entity, it does not matter. It does not matter. I need to keep my eyes focused on Jesus. When I can see Jesus, it'll be easy for me to identify beastly power. I will know if someone tries to enforce me to worship on Sunday, that is the mark of the beast. If someone tries to force me to do anything, that is coercion. That is satanic. Not even God forces us to worship on Sabbath. If Adventists were in power and they tried to force people to worship on Saturday, that would be beastly. We know what the beast looks like. We know what it sounds like. We don't have to be afraid because we know who Jesus is. And our trust is in him, family. We just trust him. And that's what the Sabbath message in prophecy teaches us. Lord, you know, and I'll just put my trust in you. I won't sit in quietude. I'm not going to just, just be, be, be callous and, and say, oh, whatever. Lord, I will work. I will work against these things coming to pass because I don't want to see the world in peril. I don't want to see people suffer. I'll do my part. And I'll let you do your part because I trust you. I trust you. The Sabbath at its core, in every iteration, there is one thread that runs through the entire lessons we've been teaching you. It is trust. I trust you, Creator. You made this day holy and special for me. I trust you. It was made for me. Okay, I trust you. You're the deliverer. I trust you. You're the provider. I trust you. It's a day of holy convocation. I'm, I'm gonna, you call me to delight in it. I trust you. It's a day of joy. I trust you. A day for me to abide in you. I trust you. A day that you've redeemed me and you've rested so that I don't have to work anymore. I trust you. And Isaiah says this. We're, we're done. We're done. Isaiah, the last, the last, the last, the last verse. Listen to what Isaiah says. Isaiah 66, the final chapter. Isaiah 66. 
Listen to what, the, what God says through the prophet. He says in verse 22, as the new heavens and the new earth that I make will endure before me, so will your name and descendants endure. Man, that's so powerful. You're going to endure. I'm going to endure. So will your name and descendants endure from one new moon to another and from one Sabbath to another. All mankind will come and bow down before me. Remember, prophecy, that's what this is, prophetic. Not enforcing it. I'm telling you what's going to happen. You're going to be so in love with me and the way that I'm in love with you. You watch. As the new heavens and the new earth are formed, he's talking about the future. Yes, there probably was a local impact for Israel, but this goes beyond that. As the new heavens and the new earth will endure before me, as I, as I create a new heaven and a new earth, I'm telling you, from one new moon to another, that means from month to month, and watch this, from one Sabbath to another. This is God's way of saying 24-7. But watch this. Time, even in heaven, is measured by the Sabbath. Time on the new earth is still measured by the sacredness of the Sabbath that you now know has so much meaning. Even in the end, God still says this to you like he did at the beginning. I like you. And I'm going to like you and love you forevermore. Are you willing to put your trust in a family? How many here just want to stand on this alone? I need to do a better job in fully trusting Jesus. And every Sabbath will be a reminder that I need to put more of my trust in him. I'm going to ask you to stand to your feet as we pray. Father God, you see those who are standing right now. And there might be some here today that have no experience with Adventism, have never really heard about the Sabbath. And Father, if that is who they are, I ask you to convict their hearts and to gently woo them and have them connect with one of us pastors so that we can teach them more. But Father, for those of you who, you know, for those of us who have been in this faith for a long time and we haven't seen all of the beauty of the Sabbath, we thank you for this series. Father, if it comes to a, another National Sunday law that is more violent, we're ready because we trust you. We're ready because our hearts are woven with yours. So, Father, you see those who are standing. They want to be sealed with your Holy Spirit. The only thing that is moving them and motivating them is your Holy Spirit. And they'll do more than just fulfill the law. Oh, yes, they'll be commandment-keeping people, but not because they're looking at some manual. They're looking to you. It just looks the same, that's all. Not plastic fruit, but real fruit. So, Father, seal their commitment this afternoon as we sing one more time that we trust you, Jesus. Amen.